Welcome back to another episode of ABOR's Chat with the Experts. Today we have the infamous former chief economist of the Texas A&M Center, Dr. Jim Gaines, and I am Kalea Youngblood, chief marketing officer of the Austin Board of Realtors. Dr. Gaines, thank you so much for joining us. We always love to have you, and uh, I know our members are just anxious to hear what you have to say about this crazy market we're experiencing. It is true, and thank you. It's my pleasure to be here. So yesterday, the Austin Board of Realtors um, released the December and year-end 2020 Central Housing Market Report. And I just thought, well, we'll just top off the interview here with, with that. The Austin and Round Rock Metropolitan Statistical Area, or MSA, closed 2020 by breaking records as housing demand across the region reached unprecedented levels, which is a word we continue to hear over and over, a record-breaking 40,165 homes totaling in an ungodly amount of sales yeah, volume. Yeah, exactly. We sold across the Austin area last year. So what I really want to start us off today is how did we get here? How did we get into this crazy market conditions we're, we're experiencing now? There are, I mean, first of all, you always know that the housing market is just a function of people and jobs. Uh, and, and there's no, no, two ways about it, that for the last decade, uh, the Austin area has been attracting so many businesses, uh, so many new startup businesses, existing companies moving into the area. They're continuing to come. We're still seeing uh, even new announcements almost weekly of somebody doing something. Of course, the last big one, biggie big one was the Tesla. But but uh, but there are other smaller ones that that when they when you add them up they come in. Well, that's causing people to come here. And of course, it's, it's also true, as as I'm sure everybody in Austin is well aware that every time there's one of these uh, uh, lists put out by any of the national all publications, the I know it <laughs> of the top five of the top ten places. In fact, uh, one just came out last week that Austin was the number one city to live in for 2021. Uh, another one, I, I, I can't remember if it was Wallet Hub, but it was somebody like that or Zillow. I think it was Zillow that came out with that. So what we're seeing is an influx of people, which is uh, essential, of course, and then jobs, because the people have to have jobs going. The types of jobs being created too is, the, is interesting because the high tech types of jobs, the service jobs that are servicing the high tech industries, uh, the sort of the secondary jobs, if you will, and then the tertiary jobs of, of the dry cleaners and the restaurants and and all of the support uh, activities. Now, those have gotten hit hard with the COVID. Right. But the the other the other types of jobs and and Austin also has the advantage that these kinds of jobs being created generally could be worked remotely. Mm -hmm. uh, they they did not they weren't as subject to uh, layoffs and and closures and so forth as some of the other towns and cities where the economy is a little bit different kind of mix. San Antonio, for example, more leisure and hospitality uh, than the, than Austin. And of course, Austin, of course, being the state capital, you have the the government and so forth. Sure, so, sure. The people, jobs, and then the third thing that's really stimulated this demand surge that we've seen the last decade that continues to go forward is, of course, the low interest rates. Uh, there's no doubt that that is a, a very strong stimulant. That's, that's pretty universal across the board because, as you know, the whole United States, the housing market nationally is doing quite well. Home construction is doing well. Uh, home sales are up. Uh, the report just came out, I think it was yesterday or this morning from NAR of, of December, home sales nationally uh, hitting record highs, new home sales hitting record highs. So, so that's not unique to Austin, but Austin, Austin is still charging ahead. Yeah. Uh, very strong. And, and, uh, and I'll tell you for what it's worth, we're expecting it to continue to charge strong on into 2021. I know well, that was my next question. <laughs> I know you're going to lead me there. You beat me to it. Yeah. So we know it's fueling the demand. And, um, you know, what we're seeing also is, while it feels like there's nothing on the market where we reached a 0.6 uh, months of inventory, which is just 
historically low. And yes. so, but we're, we're also seeing the same amount of inventory go on the market. It's just the demand that's taking it off the market so quickly. Do you have any words or, or thoughts on the low inventory that we're experiencing and what that's doing to um, this influx of people that we've been seeing? Yeah, yeah. 0 0.6 months of inventory in Aggie speak, you ain't got none. Careful now, we're in Austin. <laughs> I know. <laughs> in Aggie speak, you ain't got none. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> we sure uh, don't. But but it's, but but your point is excellent. Uh, you're exactly correct. The 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 low inventory. The biggest impact there is that you're seeing sort of a just in time inventory. Uh, houses are selling very quickly when they do become available for sale, particularly in the price categories. Uh, in that 250 to 350, 400,000 uh, price category. Uh, and, and so you're going to, you're seeing, you're experiencing and going to continue to experience for the next year or more uh, fairly aggressive price increasing, uh, price increases. That high demand with a restricted supply is just economics 101. It, it's going to result in, in, in higher prices and that's coming. The interesting point is why isn't there more inventory? Uh, why aren't there more homes for sale? And I, I know uh, the members of ABOR will be interesting because right now, you know, you can make a very good living as a real estate agent just doing listings. You don't need to oh, do yeah. a sale, just get this listings. It's sold right now, yes, absolutely. Exactly. Yeah. <laughs> exactly. Well, and, and I, I'm often asked the question, why isn't there more inventory? Why, what's, what's going on? Um, because historically we haven't had that. You you talk about historically low months inventory. In Austin, the long-term average months of inventory is five months, which is actually even tighter than most metropolitan areas. Generally, we figure six. Right, but, right. But I can tell you doing the, I, you know, where we do a lot of numbers crunching over at the center. And for Austin specifically, it's more like five. Uh, so five, maybe five and a half. So 0.6, obviously, by any standard is real. But, but here's what's happening. Uh, people with this color hair, we're, we're not selling. <laughs> the, the, <laughs> boomers, the boomers and the older Gen X, which are the biggest homeowner group of existing homes, are, are not moving. They're, they're not selling as, as rapidly as they used to. Used to be sort of a market standard was five to seven years people generally kind of churned or turned over their housing uh, there was the move up market so you had the people who entered the market five seven years later they go to the second home five seven years they go to the third home uh, and and the the issue here is that the older groups the the boomers and the older gen x's are now staying i think NA, nar just released a report earlier this week that I think it was indicating 13 and a fraction years mm. was the average tenure of people who were selling their house. That's interesting because, and I, I really forgot about that statistic with all of the, the, you know, buzz of everything else going on with regards to inventory, but the idea that people are not moving as often is interesting. So you finally plant your flag and you're here and you love it. And I'll and be if I'm not going to move. A, you refinanced with a three and a half or three percent mortgage. Exactly. There's no inducement. There's no okay. inducement, and then you've got to fight the battle of what can I go find. Well, right. Yeah. Well, let's go back real quick to the two hundred and fifty to three hundred fifty thousand dollar price range, and um, you know, talk about that sort of move up buyer. Whereas not even three years ago, the $150,000 to $250,000 price range was sort of the lower end, which is completely obsolete now. So what are we seeing? Is the $250,000 to $350,000 price range the low end of the market right now? In fact, has the $200,000 home just gone away? And Well, yes and no. Uh, you were talking about the Austin MSA when you introduced us here yes. earlier. And yeah. you have to remember that's a that's a multi county. It's a five county area. Correct. The the hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house can be found, but not in Travis County. Mm -hmm. In general, in general, and by and large, it's very difficult to even find it in uh, Williamson County. You well, might find it saying. down in Hayes, uh, but it'll be in the smaller community and more outlying. And that's the other pattern of activity that's going on. Some are calling it the pandemic effect. Okay. What does that uh, the, mean? 
Tell us well, about that. It's the, it's the uh, and I'm sure you've been reading and talking and thinking about this, people looking for more space. They're looking for, they're, especially uh, the 26 to 38 year old millennials. And I'm kind of overlapping my age groups a little bit, but the 26 to 38 group, that's the group really driving a lot of this. And of course, a lot of these jobs we were talking about earlier in Austin are being filled, those high tech jobs by people in that age, general, that age group. If they've been cooped up for the last eight months in an 800 square foot apartment, they're ready to go find some space. Or if you're like me, the dining room table is not my kid's school. <laughs> exactly. exactly. And, and that's also changing the demand for the design of the houses. Uh, mm -hmm. I, I've, I've talked to several of the home builder groups as well, and, and they are being asked for things like uh, more space for the kids to, if they have to go to school or, or, or sort of the designated education area. But also, if both the husband and wife are now working for home, they don't want to work in the same room together. We need so a Zoom you, room. You want two, you, the Zoom room, exactly. Yeah. So you want two offices. Uh, I mean, it's well, been traditional for offices in the house, but now there's two of them. That, that's interesting because I was curious about that with the new home builders ability to even just keep up, let alone have some changes in their floor plans and, and architect, architectural designs versus just, I've got to get it out there. You know, we need, we need homes and then they're just going to sell with the waiting list, you know? So yeah. it's yeah, always I, a challenge. Sure. Sure. Well, let's um, talk about this a little bit because with the record low inventory and rising prices, do you think we're approaching, dare I even say the bubble word. I mean, you know, is, is that even like, should, dare I even say it? What do you think about that? Because it's starting to sort of be this undertone with this, you know, crazy market and high rising prices and low interest rates. What do we say back to our, our realtor friends when they are asked that question about a, a, a client? Are we, are we approaching a bubble? Is this going to be a bubble economy? I, for the time being, I, I don't think so. Uh, obviously, if this goes on for a number of years more, uh, and I don't know exactly what that number is, mm -hmm. uh, but if it goes on for a number of years more, you could approach it. Because at some point in time in the future, uh, the, 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 and, and actually we're, we're beginning to see it, see it now, even the rate of increase is slowing down but it's slowing down from like 25% to 15%. So it's still, right. it's still, still high. Yeah. But it, it, if I was the true economist, I would confuse you by saying it's increasing at a decreasing rate. Okay. Yeah. That, Tell yeah, me what that means. <laughs> that's what, that's what I'm talking about. It is increasing, but it's, it's not increasing as fast as it was here the last couple of years. We still think 2021 is going to be a, a, a phenomenally good year, but statistically, it might not show the same percentage rate of increase as 2020 did. I see. Now, part of that is because the comp computation is going to be from a higher base. So there's okay. part of that's just the arithmetic. But yeah. but uh, but if, but it is true. So and that's how you avoid the bubbles. I'm pointing that out because that's how you avoid the bubbles. And we don't think it's a bubble right now. Uh, Somewhere in the future, if we go back to interest rates, I don't think we'll go back to mortgage interest rates like uh, that I grew up with when they were near double digits. Right. But they hopefully could still, we never see that again. Hopefully we don't see that again. But they could still go into you know the mid to high single digits, anywhere from five, six, seven percent, perhaps, mm -hmm. which was true at the beginning of the of the uh, uh, Great Recession. Mm -hmm. The mortgage interest rate was a little over 6% at that time. And everybody thought that was really good. Yeah. So yeah. if we went back to that, you would see some pricing effect. People, the, 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 the purchasing power of the dollar is lower if the interest rate's higher. So you can't afford to pay quite as much. But then it's a matter of how incomes are keeping track. Sure. If I'm thoroughly confusing the issue. My, my answer to your question is, I don't think, no, I don't think we're in bubble territory right now. I don't think we're we're uh, even really that near it, but there is there is a reason that you you do want to be concerned that prices don't get completely out of hand uh, and, and go so far that it does create a bubble. The other part point that I might make is that uh, 
And this is true in Austin, and it's true in, in our two, our three other major Texas markets, uh, San Antonio, Dallas, uh, and Houston. We're kind of catching up with the rest of the country. Uh, Texas and our, our major MSAs here in this state, remember Dallas and Houston are number four and five uh, in, in the country in terms of just sheer size and magnitude. Uh, but we are the most affordable of the major MSAs or among the most affordable. There's while, only it doesn't, a... while it doesn't feel affordable to us, it's very affordable to those influx of people that are moving here from oh, yeah. those other oh, yeah. metropolitan areas. Yeah. Yeah. All, you, all the realtors out there, just ask anybody who just moved here from California what they think. Or yeah. from New Jersey or New York mm -hmm. or some of the other areas of the country. So in some sense, we're, we're kind of catching up. We're going to see it uh, play out, though, also in the new home uh, market. Uh, new, the new homes are going to increase in price faster than even the existing homes because they're getting a, a lot of cost push. Uh, labor cost, material cost, land cost in particular uh, uh, are driving the new home construction and it's at a record high too. I mean, we're talking about record home sales. I think they were, I just read a statistic that it's about 1.1 months worth of inventory or something of that yes. nature, which is also crazy. Yeah, very crazy. Exactly, mm -hmm. yeah, exactly. And and I, I and talking to a number of the home builders, uh, several of them have told me just in the last, uh, that they've had to do fairly significant price increases twice in the past year mm -hmm. to cover some of these costs that are, that now, they just they don't have any choice. And, and I, when I'm, I'm talking about twenty, thirty thousand dollar price increases. Do you foresee that subsiding? Is that just a result of covid or is that just in general cost of labor and and materials or is that yes. cost of materials because of covid? <laughs> yes. yes, and yes. <laughs> it's, it's a little bit of everything. It's a little bit of both. Um, the labor costs, for example, have been affected by COVID, but also by immigration policies uh, at the federal level that we've had now for the last four years. Uh, to, and I don't know how that's going to pan out, uh, but we haven't had as much influx of, of the foreign uh, workers. Uh, it's also the COVID because labor uh, workers building a house, for example, uh, still have to wear masks and, and distance and some of them get sick and then they have to quarantine by by uh, being uh, with each other and so on. We've also had the, the pandemic has created uh, uh, some hardship or some limitations on importing materials, particularly from China. Mm -hmm. uh, a lot of LED lighting and fixtures and other kinds of things have been have been limited. So it's not only the, the cost has gone up, but delivery. You just can't get it delivered. Sure. Uh, so let's let's talk a little bit about, you know, what do we tell buyers today where we're seeing there's lines out of the house for, you know, showings, there's, you know, scarcity in inventory and we have an influx of buyers. And, and I had a colleague say this and it kind of rang true to me the other day, which was, you know, now is still a time to plant your flag in the sand of Austin, Texas. Um, and while it's it might be harder to do that today, it's sure as hell gonna be more expensive to do that in two years or three years, right? And so what do you say to that? What, what can we say to buyers that um, makes Austin remain desirable and helps our realtor friends sell homes and continue to get out there and, and drive this market that is at, you know, a historic, a historic time right now. Well, you, you, you just hit the nail on the head. Um, I mean, if you are a potential buyer, if you've just moved to town or if you've been a renter and are looking to move up in that move out market, the moving out of the rental and into home ownership, uh, and that has been something that has been commented on by a number of economists that we're, we're seeing that. Uh, if, if there's no point in sitting on the fence, the only the only reason right now you might sit on the fence is because you can't find what you want. Uh, so there's there's the argument that that so many buyers right now are are actually having to kind of accept whatever they can find, and they're not able to really go out and and shop, if you will, and and have choices. And then when they find something that they're willing to accept and want. Then they're going to maybe have to bid on it and and act quickly. Uh, you're not going to be able to drag your feet 
and, and say, well, I'll come back and look at the house again next Saturday, or I'll come back next Thursday or whatever. It, it ain't going to work that way. No. Because it, it, it probably <laughs> is going to have a contract on it by then, and it's going to be gone. Now, that's that's an interesting dilemma for the sales agent, because how do you say that or communicate that without sounding pushy? But but that's what you almost have to be is pushy. Uh, the, the, no, you don't really have time to sit and think about this. Well, just the shared numbers and data in the MLS right now show uh, days on market and, and you know, there's some some factual information that you can combat that with a little bit. I think, you know, we're just um, seeing people getting a little disgruntled and we want to make sure that the, this is a, a perfect time to use a realtor to help navigate through some of these nuances of a tough market and a tight market, but it's still time to buy. It is still a good time to move to Austin and you just kind of stick it out and, and find the house that you that's right for you, even though it might be a little bit more challenging than uh, years past or maybe a couple of years from now, right? Yeah, and, and even, I mean, that's the reason a lot of people have shifted from leaving looking at existing homes and gone over to build, buy a new home because then yeah. they can work with the builder and maybe design it and so on. But then they're, they're still, they got to go find where the, the builders have lots. Yeah. The land inventory, particularly the developed lot inventory is also very limited. So, and most of that is now out in the suburbs. That's one of the second pandemic effects that's being talked about is yeah. the, the look for the need or the look for space, but also, now, if I'm working more from home, if I'm going to be working remotely, if I'm not going to have to go into an office every day, I can I can live a little further out. I don't need to. And, and hopefully, maybe uh, maybe that'll help I-35. <laughs> I, I, don't we it, all help? Don't we all hope? Yeah. Yeah. It, it needs all the help it can get. Uh, <laughs> And 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 perhaps it'll it'll at least have some impact. I don't honestly. I don't think it's going to help that much. I thirty five is still going to be a challenge. <laughs> yeah, it's still be a challenge. But well, but we're seeing we're seeing some of this move out into the suburbs, the exurbs. That movement had already started. There was nothing new about that. But it may be exacerbated by the pandemic and and people working uh, remotely. The I can tell you the statistics. Uh, are that, uh, you know, something like 8%, 9% of the workforce nationally was working at home or working from home prior to the pandemic. And that that number hit almost 40%. Austin, really? That's a great statistic. Austin, okay. well, Austin was one of the one of the markets in the country that hit in the higher percentages of people being able to work remotely because of the high tech industries and so forth that are there, the service industries where you don't literally need to absolutely have to be in the office every day. Making so, Austin even more desirable. Yeah. So again, you're going to now see a lot more of the spread of Austin. And, and one of the one of the terms I haven't heard anybody use, and I'm hesitant to throw it out, but our realtors and ABOR needs to hear this because you're going to be having to fight it here pretty soon. Okay. That's the urban sprawl. Oh, here we go. <laughs> I mean, have you heard anybody mention that lately? No, I haven't. But we know that sprawl is inevitable, you know, yeah. and it has been like to your point, it has been for several years now. Um, and the, the need for housing and affordable housing and all of that is is sort of obsolete now. It's just going to happen and we need to prepare for it. Well, I you were know. asking about that hundred and fifty to two hundred and fifty thousand dollar house. You can find those houses. You can even find new housing in that price, but you're going to be a lot further out. Right. Uh, you're going to be in Bastrop County. You're going to be in Gonzales County. You're going to be uh, uh, out further and, and more to the east than to the west. And everybody right. knows everybody in Austin wants to live to the west. Well, there's not much there now. Is, is no, there? no. I mean, you know, supply demand is still is still affecting it. Uh, and, and you're gonna you're gonna continue to see it, but th these areas will they'll develop, they'll become uh, good communities. Uh, th there's nothing wrong. It, the transportation network is going to be the challenge, and the utility priority. Yes, yes. While I have you, Dr. Gaines, what are some other you know maybe state or national soundbite statistics or anything that's pertinent or? or that you've maybe said on other talks with other um, uh, entities that 
you need to, us to know what is, is what's going on at a state level and national level that might be a good takeaway for our membership? Well, uh, one of the takeaways, I suppose, and this is this is a little bit longer term down the road, maybe five years or more. Um, state and local taxes are going to become a problem. I mean, think of what's going on now, what needs to go on in the next year or two. We were just talking about transportation, utilities, and the limitations. It all costs money. How are, you gonna, how are you gonna address those issues? It's gonna be a lot of public funding, new roads, new highways, expansion of highways, and so forth. Um, uh, I, I, almost every local community, in addition to the national government borrowing nearly $4 trillion in the last 12 months, uh, but but even the state and the local communities are, are running the same problem. I, I, the legislature's in session right now. You know, the legislature by law only has to do one thing every time it meets, and that's a budget. That's the only thing it actually has to do by law. Now, it does a lot of other things. I was going to say, there's a lot of other things that are going on, too. <laughs> but that's the only one that's required. Right. They, they can't, they have to do a budget. And, and, and that's, that's a challenge. If I understand it correctly, and I'm, I don't pretend to be the expert in public finance, but if I understand it correctly, the state of Texas is, is right now kind of in the, in the red because of all the things that have been happening here the last uh, eight, nine, 10 months that were completely unanticipated, obviously not budgeted for, uh, necessary to do. And even the, the local communities, the counties, the county health district, the cities, uh, doing all of the kinds of uh, activities with hospitals and care and getting out the vaccine. I mean, I don't know if you've had your vaccine shot. I got my first one. Good but for it, you. It, it, nope, it, it, I haven't. It's, it's free. Well, somebody, it, there's no such thing as a free lunch. Somebody's right. paying for it. Mm -hmm. uh, now, it, 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 whether it's the feds or, or, or what have you. My point being, we're going to see physical issues of taxation and so forth down to the local level are, is going to raise its head here in the next few years. Think of the school districts and what they've had to do here with educating the kids with the online and all of the services, even to the point of trying to get computers in the hands of all the kids who don't have them or right. Wi-Fi service. All of these kinds of things are adding to the cost. Actually, one of the good things about our housing market that we were talking about and prices going up, the property tax base has stayed up and healthy. So things like the school district that relies completely almost on the on the local property tax, uh, they're not as hurt as much as, say, the city that relies on sales tax or the state that relies on sales tax or the energy extraction tax at the state level. Now, Austin doesn't benefit or hurt very much from the energy sector, but the rest of the state does or a good bit of the state and the state revenue. That's the point. Gotcha. Uh, so we need to keep our eye on the tax on taxes in the next. That's going to be that's going to be a challenge. The other challenge you're going to going to run into is the regulatory control of land uses. Uh, uh, Tesla had to go further out to buy the property that it wanted for its for its facility. But think of I mean, just imagine in your head what's going to potentially get developed all around that area. Oh, yeah. Yeah. It, it's, you know, it's, it's incredible it's, uh, growth. You can you can see it. It happens everywhere, and and uh, as you were saying, Austin has sort of a little of a limitation regulatorily and physically going west when you get into the hill country and so forth, uh, and a big limitation there is water and utilities and resources. So a lot of the a lot of that growth is being forced back to the east. That, that it's been we, the, the market kind of fought that growth for a long time. I think that that battle is pretty much it's over. over. Yeah. It, now, now it's just how is the best way to do it? Not whether to do it or not, but just what's the best way to do it? Sure, sure. So taxation and where to grow is is a big one. Yeah, right. Well, um, I would just say, you know, we, we super appreciate you being here today. It's always, you know, words of wisdom from Dr. Gaines and our members just love you and love uh, when you come to see us. So I, I appreciate you jumping on the on the horn with me today and, and um, letting us know what's going on for 2021. What is just last minute parting 
words for our realtor members. Um, what can they what can they say to their clients to expect about this coming year? What is the crystal ball? It sounds really positive. Um, what what in just a couple of words should our uh, realtor members be saying to their clients? Stay the course. It's going to be a strong market. You're going to be busy, realtors. You're going to be busy. Uh, and, and the people need you, the buyers and sellers need you to be informed and communicative and, and help guide them through the process. Awesome. Well, thank you again for your time. And we hope to see you in person next time. Yes, me too. <laughs> All right. We'll talk to you soon. Thanks so much for joining us. My pleasure. Thank you.